Yesterday was the Jetty Wolf's 13th birthday. And I was going to explain long-term ownership of this boat, financing, uh, motors, everything that's ever went wrong, like buying parts and things like that. I was going to go through it. It was going to be a 30-minute video. Well, I just don't have time now. I still will probably do it. And it's going to be just a boat ownership type thing. You got a beautiful day. Nobody wants to go. So I'm going to do this video. What it's all about is this right here. You know, no matter how hard you work in this business right here that takes that well over a hundred and something thousand dollars to keep going. I mean, that's that's what I've got invested. I put over five hundred dollars into that last January, that lower unit. And then right before I went in for my surgery for the prostate thing, I dropped another five hundred in that lower unit right there. Then I did that video where I was doing the ridline flush and the, the interior anodes, right? Well, here's some of the anodes that came out right there. I soaked them in ridline. I'm going to reuse these now. So that's another thing. It got them all nice and clean. To do that video about the ridline flush on the Suzuki and everything, and I didn't even have the lower unit on, so that was being fixed. That was going to be the $500 bill there. And then I was doing that ridline flush and everything. That cost me $80. In the last two plus weeks, I've had one charter. And that today is Sunday, and that was this past Friday. The weather shut me down that whole week. Week prior was the sitting around, you know, after the prostate surgery. You know, you're watching these channels, and these people don't have $150,000, $100,000 things that they're having to maintain. There's these kayakers out there now that they don't own shit. They own a kayak and some tackle. And these guys, YouTube, full-time fishing because it doesn't really cost them anything to go fishing. So there's several of those out there now. And they get to travel around and do all this. I'm working my ass off to stay in business 24 seven. Keep this going and keep that right there going and keep this paid for. I, I don't watch fishing much. I see the, co the correlation between the charter fishing business after 23 years and that I, I know this business inside and out, okay? And YouTube, I see that too. The lower the overhead, the better off you can be. I get depressed every time I look at how many people actually visit a video and, um, or view a video and then look at the subscriber list, which means nothing. It doesn't mean a thing. I'm gonna go back to that video that I said I was gonna do. And I'm gonna talk about how I bought the most important thing in my life. I had three, three of you when I, when it was its 13th, 14th, 13th birthday, 14th birthday, I guess, I guess it was, I don't know. Three of you said, yeah, do a video all about how this came about. Really, am I supposed to get excited about doing a video when only three people were interested? So that's where I'm at. Everything is just seeming to be such a struggle. So I got a project that I'm going to do here. And I'm going to work on this because I'm going to work on this video all week. This is going to take me a week, a week to do this probably when it's all said and done. So I got a little project I'm going to do before I'm going to do anything on YouTube. Well, I got my little project done and I did my little complaining and I'm in the wolf den and what I'm gonna do is we're doing a throwback here. 
you really want to know how I ended up getting a 26 foot aluminum boat. Well, it all started in about 2003. I opened up because a friend of mine used to give me a bunch of uh, National Fisherman magazines. National Fisherman is the magazine for commercial fishermen. There's a lot of their news in there. There's a lot of boat stories, boat builds. And I looked in the back of National Fisherman. And what did I see? I saw basically a business card sort of ad that looked like that. Not exactly, but it looked like that. The, the perfect fishing tool. Tough, safe, seaworthy, no maintenance, lifetime guaranteed. And it had that logo right there. Black Lab Plate Alloy Boats. A wonderful guy that I still stay in touch with today, Jay Parada of Black Lab Marine. He was, he's all the way up in Maine. So I saw this, this business card ad, a little tiny ad in the back of the magazine. Let me show you a little something. When I finally got really interested in 2005, this is what Jay sent me. Now to give you the backstory, the company that build the boats, and they're of course still around today, is called Pacific. What they did back when Jay had basically a dealership, I guess you could call it, in Maine. And he's the one that put the ad in the National Fisherman magazine that I saw. Jay got to name the boats and brand them any, anything he sort of wanted east of the Mississippi. That was his territory. He took over east of the Mississippi. So mine is literally a black lab because I bought it east of the Mississippi. But it was built because you see the, the insignia on the boat down here. It says Pacific. Because they were so far away, they built them in Marysville, Washington, and they're still there today. But that's what he did. He sent me this on uh, Tuesday, February 22nd, 2005. And that's a picture of the standard sort of 23-footer with a Honda, the hard top with the big wheelhouse kind of thing. And the uh, it came down to a, a box seat with a leaning post with a seat in the back. And you can see how much room there is right there. Not that much. So... I, ch I didn't want this particular console. It kind of took up too much. And at that time, I didn't even want uh, a top on it. So here you go. This is basically the whole idea here is the brochures he put together himself. It was such a simple idea. Take the all-welded, heavy-duty hulls built by Pacific Boast and used for years by military and commercial mariners. Then add a large center console, leaning post rod holder, seating, and other amenities direct, directed by recreational fishermen and make these available for Eastern US mariners. All welded, unsinkable, no maintenance, plate alloy boats from 19 to 26. That's what it sort of looks like underneath. That's my stringers. They're boxes. Big boxes. And there they are putting down the plate deck. The boats, an alloy boat construction of same size, weighs 33 to 50% less than a well-made heavy layup fiberglass boat. The way that these are designed, this is very interesting. When people look at my boat, you know, it doesn't have ribs running down it. And this is actually what it, the design is called. Our naval architect uses a semi monaco Q monaco Q design that takes advantage of the alloy plate strength. You may be familiar with this design type in the carbon fiber car bodies of both Indy and Formula One cars, where there is no true frame. The skin is the frame, and the design is incredibly stiff and strong. 
That's how Pacific builds their boats. Other aluminum boats that you see on a daily basis, the United States Coast Guard. There's a picture of one up being with the welded deck getting put in. It's all uh, non-skid, okay, got non-skid paint inside. It's all foam injected under the deck. And there's the facility. There they are foaming under the deck. And there's a picture of it welding the uh, console to a deck. And then it goes through, like say, the 19-footer, see? And this is still true today, the little big boat. And there you go. A lot of those turn into the best bay boat ever made. And you can drive over oyster beds with it. So then here's just the 20 uh, foot center console, different variations. They made it with just a console and put T tops on them. And then here's the one with the pilot housey kind of hard top. They call it the three quarter hard top with the box seat. Right, there's another photograph of it. Glass, three ways around. So, when Jay sent me this, because when did he send it to me? February of 22nd is when he put this in the mail. And mine was delivered to my door on October 18th of 2006. So there you go, there's a 23 with those same configurations. You've got a 23 walk around. That's the 23 walk around. Little pilot house kind of boat. Then you get into the 26, and that was the standard 26 right there. There's a picture of it. You can see all this on their website, but there's the basic boat that turned me on like no tomorrow, right there. All right, eight foot six beam. It says 140 gallons right there. But here is the tag off of the gas tank that I replaced after 10 years because it started leaking. And it says capacity 150. So they might have changed it. And it gets into the 26 walk around. And they had various length cabins. And I was really on the fence. I was almost going to get this, this boat. Because look. Look at that. Tons of fishing room and you can walk right in. But I'm glad I didn't. Because since you're by yourself all the time, when you pull up to the dock, you got to run out of that. and You'd have to run out and tie off. Which is very kind of difficult. Talks about... What people think is constantly going to happen. Oh, the boat, you stick it in salt water and it's just going to go away. Well, it doesn't. So then we get to this. Here was basically the price list. Now, this is what makes me laugh. Okay, this is no power, but there's a 26 center console. Includes all the same features as the 20 footer and 140 gallon internal fuel tank which actually turns out to be 150. So you get everything the 20 footer gets. Center console, locking console door, windshield, grab rails, teleflex steering, stainless steel steering wheel, horn, running lights, complete electrical system, five welded eight inch cast aluminum cleats, internal fuel tank with sender fuel gauge, welded self bailing deck, transponder plates, sacrificial anodes and two Perco in gunnel rod holders. $30,150 for a 26 foot boat made like a tank. That's sort of the difference right there. Here is a back stern picture of one of the long walk arounds, the 26 walk around. It had a lift out. I don't even think they do this anymore. It just had a simple lift out starboard uh, like tuna door. Now they make them where it opens on the side. And this one has a kicker bracket built in. And many times they leave this open, but this one here has sliding doors on each side. What process did I have to go through? Well, I went to Maine. I left here on a July uh, weekday, I believe. It was the first day of the Greater Jacksonville Kingfish Tournament, so I think it was a Thursday back then. 
and got on an airplane and went to Yarmouth, Maine. Jay actually got us a cabin in the woods down from the L.L. Bean place in Freeport, Maine, and it was fantastic. And then Jay's office was at a marina that was sort of a cove, and then went out into another huge bay, all dotted with rock islands, small ones, big ones, ones with houses on it, and we spent the th three of the most fantastic days up there in the middle of July. And the reason I brought these out is this, besides his boat, he had a 23 foot and he had a single 225 Honda. The second or third day, this guy's name was Maurice. This man, his boat was, he had a Pacific or a black lab or whatever you want to call it at that time. And it was in like Gulfport or Biloxi, Mississippi. A hurricane came by and I don't know which hurricane. Might have been Katrina. I, I can't remember. And blew it out of the rack that this boat sat in. It crushed the console. So what did he do? He got the insurance money but gave it to a buddy of his. And his buddy was rebuilding the entire boat. Because why? This man owned the company that makes those giant white cylinders that go on the back of propane trucks. So that's a big business. And he loved his boat so much, he was probably in his 70s. And he brought down a trailer. And this was pretty much delivered the day before or something. And he got it all. He got radar, a windlass on the front. He had the drop-down curtains. It was just a beautiful boat. We spent an entire day breaking in that boat, and then he put it on a trailer and drove it all the way back to Biloxi, Mississippi. Here's the back of his boat. I took a picture of the back of his boat, which is the same as mine. It has a starboard door, and there's the scuppers. He had a 225 Suzuki. And then he had that engine guard and I asked him, I said, Maurice, why are you getting the engine guard? And he says, because I love the tie off to the oil rigs and the gas rigs. And he says, this will protect my engine if I swing around and bang into them. And his old boat still lived on because of course he had probably state of the art welders that worked for him. Just like the people who build these are true fabricating guys. He bought the boat off of the insurance company or something. He had a real basic boat, I believe. He didn't have all this. He had just a basic center console or something. And he says it landed sort of upside down or whatever and crushed the console when it flew out of the, uh, the uh, dry storage rack, you know, up in the air when the hurricane came by. Next, we'll go over how and why and how did I do the process? So the question in your mind is probably the, the why, the question mark is probably popping up above your head. And it all stems from my first real boat, I guess you could, I could call my own, was a 1974 Alumacraft rowboat. And it had a 15 horse uh, Ebenrude little kicker on it. And it was a freshwater boat. I used it in fresh water and then I used it in salt water. I put a trolling motor, a, a pedal trolling motor up on the bow and rod holders and everything like that. Me and my dad would fish the jetties in it. And this is back when, you know, my anchor for the jetties would be a five hole brick that I'd get at construction sites because I was doing um, I was construction work at the time, heating and air. So we were around piles of junk all the time and yellow poly rope. And we used to take that five hole brick and it was the perfect size and throw it up in the rocks. And that was my first anchor. That would be my first jetty anchor. And what stuck in my mind is a 1974 Alumacraft. It would look so antique today, and when you see one, you go, oh my God, look at that old boat. The aluminum was so thick. We used to drive right up on top of oyster beds. I mean, it was like no big deal. Bang into stuff all the time, and uh, eventually repowered it with a 20 Mercury. And it was wickedly fast, I thought. 
I wish I still had that though, because it's not. It wasn't a thin little wafer aluminum boat like they make today. This thing was so tough. You gotta remember, 1974 Alumacraft. That just stuck in my mind how unbelievably durable that boat was. So that's the reason why I really went for aluminum. But how I did it, as I told you, but to strike an, an arc on the welder, it was one third down. So we basically kind of over the phone priced out really the beginnings of my boat. After spending, like I said, three wonderful days in Yarmouth, Maine with Jay, driving us around in two different 23-footers, he said to me, I don't sell boats. The boats sell themselves. No pressure, no nothing. He was there to take your order and answer your questions and give you a test ride. And it was a fantastic experience. I know even my dad today, he, he went with me up there and I mean, he just loved it, I'm sure. When it was a done deal, we went into his office and he had a drafting table and he rolled out the plans so you could literally see it. Looking down, side view, bottom view, front view, looking to the stern, from the stern to the back, all these pages on blueprints. And he says, pull up a chair, Dave. I pulled up a chair and he says, okay, what do you want to do with your boat? I mean, what do you want to change? Here's a stock boat. And I told him, first things first is take the console and move it about two and a half feet forward. All boats are made, so they put the console a little bit aft so you get the best ride. I moved it two and a half feet forward. The leaning post went up behind it, you know, just that way too. So then um, I even had a box built off of the front of my console and it gave me ballroom dancing. And the reason being is because we're always fishing in current here. So we're always fishing towards the stern. Okay, this is before anybody, anybody ever thought about putting a trolling motor on a 31 contender. That was a glimmer in somebody's eye. So I wanted the ballroom dancing and then uh, the box that I added to the front of the basic console that I got um, gave me some extra storage. I did something like drop the bow deck. So I had sort of a tow rail of the boat, the bow deck. So I didn't do a lot to the hull itself. Uh, one thing I kicked myself in the butt right now is I wish they had I had the aluminum rub rails that they weld down the side of the boat. When I went to see Jay at Black Lab Marine, I went up there with a thirty thousand dollar check, and that's how you build these boats: one third down. It's like building a house and getting bank drafts. So I went and got totally pre-approved everything for the entire amount. I had my trailer already, so I didn't need a trailer. And I got it with a 225 Honda. You can't touch any boat today that's gonna last you in a complete lifetime for say $65,000. And I had, I dropped it on a, on a $6,300 uh, Rolls Axle trailer. And that trailer right now is like 16 years old. So that's how it all came around. So let's come on out and I'll show you a little bit of exactly what I just talked about. So if you're ever in the process of building an aluminum boat, or any boat for that matter, don't do what I did. I mean, be a little more flexible. Because right along in here, they would have built a box sort of coming out flat and then back down again. You might have seen it in some of the other pictures. They, it's a rub rail, metal rub rail, that's, that's welded on here. So you bump that instead of the docks. And instead, you know, you get all kinds of dock rash like I got, which this is a working boat. And then there is the original trailer from 16 years ago at least this Rolls Axle 27-foot trailer. 
Well, as you can see, and you see in all my other videos, I got ballroom dancing here. Fishing space. Lots. And I got more fishing space than sometimes boats twice my size. And I still have room for a 120 quart cooler that I use as a cooler slash live well with my oxygen tank that's right there. All right, there's my oxygen tank. Um, I still have room for a cooler. Just think about taking that cooler out. I mean, when I do take that cooler out, I got so much room back here. So much. Uh, let's see. Here's the box that I have built on the front of the console. Here's my windshield. So you can tell my windshield versus the one with that big three-windowed console. Okay. Instead of that three-windowed console. But I had this box built on the front. I got this storage right inside here. And the other thing that I changed over stock, I guess you could say stock, was this could have been here, right up underneath here, like this. And what I did was drop it down for a tow rail. And they will make this decking, as you can see, I'm trying to give you some perspective here in the bow. They will make this deck real short just for an anchor or extend it and I wanted the I believe this is they called this the four or five foot deck okay here's the hatch lid all right so and then I had this hole built so I could actually get thing I can use that and air can go in and out of there I didn't want it closed up here in Florida so I could just throw things in there or whatever. So then in here, and then I had him put this bulkhead in right here to separate this area from what, this is my anchor storage. So I got my big jetty anchor over here. And this is nothing but a little tool tube that I mounted under here. There you go. I mean, we're talking complete walking room on both sides. I had them add this. The rod rack here wasn't completely standard. But other than that, this was the standard leaning post, which has been reupholstered only once in 13, 14 years. I mean, I got walking room, walking room, big time here. None of that squeezing between the console and the side of the boat. That's another thing. There's no wasted space. The gunnels are all storage compartments. Easy access to the rod tubes. Plus, below it, I got a shelf on both sides. Over here, same thing. You've got the gunnel, and then again, the shelf is underneath. Oh, and then of course I did this myself. Had this chum chopper tube put in. And you can see there's a bunch of holes down in there and a chopper blade. Of course I did my top just two years ago. But you you know even without the top you can imagine just the room and the space that this provo this boat provides. Just lots of space, and in my mind, this is what I wanted as a real family charter boat. The sides are high. This is where they come up to on me. I'm 6'1", and the sides come all the way up to above my knee. Well, there you go, folks. That's basically the reasons, the story behind it. How did I find this manufacturer or this, you know, this boat builder? The why? Because I was impressed with my 14-foot 1974 Alumacraft so much. And I've always liked metal. Metal. Um, I had this boat like a week. 
and was already tying off the docks in the St. Johns River and having, a, having trouble getting perfect little finger mull at one time. They were running so close to a real steep bank with oyster beds on it. And I said, what the hell? So I just drove up on the bank and turned the engine off and walked to the back of the boat here and just threw a cast net on them. Ended up fishing there most of the day and caught a whole bunch of redfish and flounder. I have had live wells in the back. They will build you live wells. You can do anything you want. That's the difference when you have a boat built for you versus going down here to Billy Bob's Boatyard and buying one that a bunch of guys from somewhere else think that you need. Northeast Florida is terribly different than the rest of the state. You know, I consider the rest of the state, that's la-la land. You know, when I go, I used to go to the Miami Boat Show every single year in February, and the first thing I looked at was their anchor storage. Do they have jetty anchors? Do they use jetty anchors? Maybe not. So they don't know what we need. We need it. I'm not fishing like South Florida. There ain't no anything that's like South Florida anywhere around here. So why am I going to have be in a boat that has the South Florida type fishing in mind? You know, I don't care if you're in a flats boat, if you're on a surfboard with an engine on it. If it's for there, that doesn't mean it's for here. I truly believe that this is the best all around for what I do here and a lot of other places that are similar to here in Jacksonville. That's a story I could go on for hours about it, but I said I was going to try to do this video, so here you go. There you go, and I, I hope you learned a little bit about me, my boat, the Jetty Wolf, and my mentality as far as how I sort of went about doing what I did. Because a lot of people ask me, why do you have an aluminum boat? As if fiberglass is the only boat building material out there. No, it isn't. Look at all the commercial boats and the Coasties and the Sheriff's Departments and everybody that is running around near a town near you. Check out what they're in. I don't care what I look like. I don't care that it's blue or it's green or it has purple drapes or if it has stripes or or glitter or that white gel coat that blinds you when you need to go buy extra extra dark uh, fishing sunglasses. Gray and black are my two colors. I don't care about what the crowd's doing. All I care about is what goes on on this deck right here. It consumes my every waking moment. Either sitting here under its shed to keep it protected or out on the water. All I care about is what's going on right here. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. And hopefully that one will be something to do with actual fishing.